next 15 minutes i shall be talking about the approach to hypertension in diabetes let's start with a case scenario a 52 year old woman with type 2 diabetes first diagnosed two years before she presents now for routine follow-up and is noted to have a blood pressure of 160 by 100 millimeter of mercury she is asymptomatic medical history is five, five years she is having hypothyroidism dyslipidemia <clears throat> taking thyroxine 25 microgram glycolazide metformin combination 60 milligram and 500 milligram and statin 20 milligram on physical examination she was found to have height 5 feet 5 inches weight 65 kg 160 by 100 blood pressure 84 beats per minute per pulse and no other, any other abnormality systemic examination there is no retinopathy no thyromegaly no clinical evidence of congestive heart failure or peripheral vascular disease and no other abnormality detected laboratory evaluation shows that urine analysis having trace protein blood urea nitrogen 14 serum creatinine 1.2 normal and fasting blood glucose is 108 milligram per deciliter hb1c 6.9 percent electrolytes normal thyroid stimulating hormone is 1.75 and 24 hours urine collection urinary albumin excretion rate of 250 milligram per day the patient is diagnosed as hypertensive with type 2 diabetes and microalbuminuria. The question arises, what should be the clinical approach in this case? Should her blood pressure be treated? What if her blood pressure is 150-90? What if her blood pressure is 138-86? What treatment strategy should be used? As per the current guidelines, we see that guidelines suggest to keep the blood pressure 130-80. Let's find the evidences Let's check the rationality of these guidelines with the evidences. We all know that diabetes and hypertension are running as a twin epidemic in our, our country as well as across the world. The enormity of the problem is that effect of these two diseases are compounded. Whenever they are together, they are impacting not one plus one two, but one plus one three. Each perpetuates the others. Both are generating from the same soil. So that's why they are having the similar side effects. They are having the similar complications. They are having the similar risk factors. Also. The question arises, when should we start treating systolic blood pressure to treat hypertension? And this is a very old question, has also been asked in 50 years before or 70 years before and every time it has got its different answer like in glc4 and 5 recommended to treat the blood pressure at 160 systolic blood pressure glc6 has re revised its recommendation in the form of 150 mm of mercury blood pressures to be treated as systolic in glc7 american society of hypertension international society of hypertension at the same time recommended to treat the blood pressure if systolic is 140 mm of mercury sprint brought it down up to the 120 but it was in quite ideal condition which are usually not met in our routine clinical settings american college of cardiology and american heart association has given its recommendation is 2017 to keep systolic blood pressure less than 130 not only for the purpose of treatment but also for the diagnosis of hypertension even in 80 years individuals we found that blood pressure keeping less than 120 80 is beneficial as far as the cardiovascular events are concerned it has been found that even in 80 years individuals those who are having uh, uh, so much of the uh, so so much of the arterial stiffness still they are not supposed to keep their blood pressure on the higher side if they are keeping their blood pressure less than 120 80 probably they may be having lesser number of the cardiovascular events as far as the blood pressure and cardiovascular disease risk is concerned it increases with the pre-hypertension stage only 
That's why it is required to reduce the cutoff of hypertension diagnosis. Once the diabetes is there, then again it becomes compounded. And not only with the hypertension, not only with the pre-hypertension, even a person is having only diabetes, he is carrying the risk equivalent to the cardiovascular disease already existing. So that's why diabetes is most of the time is set to the cardiovascular equilibrium. Pre-hypertension and diabetes, once these two are together, then the risk becomes the highest as you can see in this particular chart. Diabetes approximately doubles cardiovascular disease risk in patients with hypertension. What we found in our Indian data, as far as in regards of the ischemic heart disease and cardiovascular adverse events are concerned, we could see if the blood pressure is kept between 120 to 129 systolic, the risk of getting death and ischemic heart disease was 1.16 at per adjusted hazard ratio, which elevated to the 1.19 only if it changed its systolic blood pressure to the 130 to 139 range. But it makes a significant impact if we talk about the stroke and cerebrovascular accident. Then if we change the category of the systolic blood pressure from 120 to 129, the risk of death and cardiovascular, uh, cerebrovascular accidents and cardiovascular disease jumps sim uh, significantly from 1.16 to 1.73 hazard ratio. So this is a very significant high, uh, higher risk in segment of the 130 to 139 that's why recommendations of keeping less than 130 have been found to be genuine major outcomes by achieved systolic blood pressure category in the accomplished trial have been seen u-shaped we could see that events per thousand patient year when they have been compared with the systolic blood pressure category we found in reference of the primary endpoint as well as in reference of the cardiovascular death, the, uh, the relationship was U-shaped. Means least amount of the risk was there at 120 to 130 mm of mercury. If we further go down less than 120, then probably we are increasing the risk of getting cardiovascular events as well as the primary endpoints of the uh, uh, risk of hypertension in forms of the non-fatal MIE and non-fatal stroke. Blood pressure lowering for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and death once it has been systematically reviewed in a meta-analysis of 123 studies which included more than 6 lakh participants. It was found that every 10 mm of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure significantly reduced the risk of major cardiovascular disease events. The results were quite supportive for lowering blood pressure to systolic blood pressure less than 130 mm of mercury. Le even at the age of 75 years, the people, those who were old, it was found that intensive blood pressure control were more useful and it was providing more benefit as far as the cardiovascular end outcomes are concerned, may it be in reference of the primary outcome or in reference of the all cause mortality. So, ultimately, BP thresholds for the goals as well as pharmacological therapy to be initiated in patients with hypertension according to the clinical conditions has been summarized in the way that for all clinical conditions that BP threshold for initiation of the therapy and BP goal for the target of blood pressure treatment achievement have been found less than 13080 almost in all clinical conditions except if you are not finding any clinical cardiovascular disease and 10 year associated cardiovascular disease risk is less than 10 percent then only you can take the liberty to diagnose hypertension by 140 and 90 for the blood pressure threshold to initiate the treatment and another category which has given the liberty to keep the blood pressure little higher for a diagnosis was the secondary stroke prevention. Once a stroke has already occurred, 
then you can give a liberty to keep at least up to the 149 deep blood pressure for the secondary stroke prevention strategy. So new target blood pressure and new cutoff for the diagnosis have been found to be 130 80 mm of mercury. Let's talk about the preferences for the medicine. For primary drug treatment of hypertension, any of the following drug can be used as an initial choice as per the recommendation of the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association in 2017. Diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARVs, calcium channel blockers. You must be remembering 20 years before in GNC7, diuretics were most preferred agent. Again, the recommendations are coming back towards the diuretic being most preferred agent as far as the cardiovascular risk prevention is concerned. But in terms of the diabetes, in presence of the diabetes, we will have to be a little more careful because most of the diuretics are having the hyperglycemia potential. As far as the blockers are concerned, these are almost listed out from the a list of the primary agents to treat hypertension. Although they are included in the list of the secondary agent to be considered as any treatment step when there is a specific indication like heart failure, angina, post MI, atrial fibrillation, or it may be younger women, those who are planning pregnancy. These are the recommendations recently received from the uh, European Society of the Cardiology in 2021. ACC AHA guidelines in 2017 has also said that under primary agent, chlorothalidone is preferred on the basis of the prolonged half-life and proven trial reduction of the cardiovascular disease. This slide makes more understanding clear about the hypertension and diabetes and as well as the treatment protocol is concerned. Whether to treat hypertension early in diabetes or if we are treating with the medication, is it really impacting diabetes and how much it is impacting? This is, a, this is important to know. The risk of diabetes associated with antihypertensive drug therapy appears to be explained by presence of hypertension. Among the subjects who had hypertension, the risk among those not taking medication was similar to that among those taking one or more agent. Among the subjects who were not taking any antihypertensive medication, the risk of diabetes was much higher among hypertensive patients than in non-hypertensive. In all head trial, it has been proven that incidence of the new onset diabetes at the four years of the treatment of hypertension was 8.1 percent in the patient those who have been treated with the lisinopril 9.8 percent those who have been treated with the amlodipine and highest that was 11.6 percent those who have been treated with the chlorothalidone so it is important to know that the treatment for the hypertension is again increasing hyperglycemia potential, especially if the person is already diabetic, it becomes quite detrimental. So we will have to be more cautious about the management of diabetes once trying to treat the hypertension with medication. Beta blockers are also supposed to be having a risk of new onset diabetes mellitus. 25% increased risk could be seen with the atinolol and 28% increased risk with the other beta blockers. Thus, choice of the antihypertensive drug matters in this reference. Yes, it definitely matters. We know that effect of ACE inhibitors or ARBs on the renal outcome has been found quite favorable and as compared to the other medications which have been used for the hypertension treatment. As far as the intensive management is concerned, we know that more intensive blood pressure lowering improves the cardiovascular outcome irrespective of the baseline systolic blood pressure and atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. Mortality and CV outcomes with RAS inhibitors, which includes the ACE inhibitors and ARB, compared with the calcium channel blockers in patients with type 2 diabetes. And here you can see that RAS blockers have been found to be more weightage and more risk reduction in terms of the all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, myocardial infarction, angina, stroke, heart failure, 
revascularization and drug withdrawal and end stage renal disease as compared to the calcium channel blocker. Mortality and cardiovascular outcomes with RAS inhibitors when it has been compared with the diuretics and uh, we, we, it was found to be having more beneficial with the RAS blockers as compared to the diuretic. Mortality and CV outcomes with RAS inhibitors compared with the beta blockers and again we could found that RAS blockers were more beneficial as compared to the beta blockers. Another recommendation which makes our uh, impact on the approach or it, it changes our approach and it gives a new variety of the approach and new concept to the approach that is the preference for the combination therapy. Almost all guidelines and all recommendations are favoring the combination therapy even from the very much start of the treatment. Dual do dose, low dose may be started with the uh, dual therapy in the step one once we are going to start the treatment. It can be upgraded with the full dose dual therapy and finally to the triple combination. And once we are progressing to the resistant hypertension, spironolactam can be added. Majority of the trials which have been done since from the very beginning from uh, UK PDS to the all head, we have seen majority of the antihypertensive or used in the patients of hypertension to treat their blood pressure were more than two. So that's why it is proven that multiple drug therapy is more beneficial for the treatment of hypertension. All cause mortality have been found to be reduced significantly by the perindopril and the pamide. As far as the ad advanced trial results are concerned, it has also recommended the combination of the ACE inhibitors with the thiazide like diuretics as an excellent first line combination which can increase the hypertension control and reduce hypokalemia cardioprotection is better and increase adherence is also there. Amlodipine have been found to be superior to hydroprothiazide in combination treatment with an ACE inhibitor in the accomplished trial. Cardiovascular mortality have been found to be significantly dropped when the perindopril have been used with the amlodipine. It was dropped around 24% as compared to the uh, atinolol and thiazide which has been used as an antihypertensive combination. Correction of the hyperglycemia also makes a big difference on the control of hypertension. What drug you are choosing for the glycemic control that also makes impact on hypertension management. Apart from vasodilating effect, there are certain drugs, may it be ELP1 receptor agonist, may it be pioglitazone or may it be DPP4 inhibitor and finally the HCLD2 inhibitors which directly inhibit the natrium hydrogen exchanger in the proximal tubule resulting in blocking the reabsorption not only of the glucose but also of the sodium. So one glucose molecule is lost with one molecule of the sodium promoting the natriuretic activity thus not only reducing hyperglycemia but also reducing the blood pressure too. The effect of SGLD2 inhibitor has been well established on HbA1c reduction, body weight reduction, stolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. Circadian rhythm has also its important impact on management of the hypertension. Morning hypertension had significantly higher frequency of the developing nephropathy and retinopathy and it is important and impactful if we somehow control the morning hypertension in majority of antihypertensive treatment. Blood pressure characteristic in diabetes is very much different than from the non-diabetic because we see majority of the diabetic patients are non-dipper or they have got the dipping reduced. Normally we find the 10 to 20 percent dipping in the blood pressure from daytime to the nighttime but in non-dipper it is less than 10 percent dipping and reverse dippers are those who actually find rise in the blood pressure at the night and extreme dippers are called those who are having more than 20 percent dipping. So that's why for these reason ambulatory blood pressure becomes more important to be used in a diabetic patient because they can only catch the non-dippers and dipper to the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Nocturnal hypertension and non-dipping put up the worse prognosis regardless of the 24 hours blood pressure. The take home message is that hypertension management mitigates vascular risk in diabetes. Therefore, blood pressure should be checked every visit. Try to catch them early 
we can start lifestyle modification even at times it crosses 120 80 loss of night dipping nocturnal hypertension and mass hypertension is more common in diabetes therefore ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring should be preferred method of monitoring blood pressure many recommendations are favoring to use cutoff 130 by 80 for both diagnosis and treatment though we still need to gather scientific evidences to support but keeping in mind our population is prone for metabolic diseases and their adverse outcome it may be good idea not to allow the blood pressure cross 130 80 mm of mercury since from the very beginning of life approach each patient individually they are recommend there are recommendation to start the treatment with combination from very first visit together with lifestyle modification attempt to offer the best of available treatment options without compromising patient safety should be the ideal for approach of hypertension in diabetes patient thank you very much for your kind listening